there. Welcome to the A Jesus Church podcast. You're listening to a teaching from our Sunday gathering. We exist to join God in the renewal of all things by becoming a unified, spirit-filled family that follows the way of Jesus. And our desire is to come alongside you to encourage and equip you for that journey. So if we can serve you in any way, please reach out to us through our website at ajesuschurch.org slash connect. As always, we hope that this teaching increases your hope and deepens your faith. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. He is able to save completely those who have come to God through him. Since we have confidence to enter the most high holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word and that you love to speak to us. We pray that you'd open our hearts for what you want to do, for what you want to stir in them. Jesus, we invite you to shape us and mold us as you speak to us today. Amen. Okay, grab a seat. Well, good morning. Uh, my name's Richard. If I don't know you, come tonight and share a bowl of pasta with me. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to family night tonight. And it's really exciting. Uh, we have finished the vision series. It's not exciting to have finished it. It, it was good. I, I heard the last teaching especially was just, you know, really... <laughs> It's quite something, yeah. Um, but today we get to start the book of Hebrews. Doesn't that look beautiful? Amazing. And, so, and, and that's not the most exciting part. The actual book is going to be really exciting. Um, and so what we're going to do today, a little bit different, is step back and sort of look at the big picture of Hebrews so we can get ourselves oriented for the kind of things we should be looking out for and the kind of things we think Jesus actually might want to do, which is why I think he's led us to this book. And, you know, reflecting on this really made me think about my own story. You know, as a young, like, uh, end of high school, you know, Jesus grabs a hold of my life, and there's just this sort of radical work of Jesus making me distinctive from all of my friends, all the people around me. Yeah, just his work and his power and, and his witness through my life really showing up. But... And then I think about, like, but it's not long as I'm, like, journeying through college that actually just to, to get by living in this world, that there's an awful lot of the things in my life that start to look an awful lot like everyone else around me. You know, just trying to tune into doing life in this world. And, you know, it, it left me wondering, is my distinctiveness getting dulled? And really quickly, getting to know Jesus, discovering, you know, the world pulls us back. You know, Jesus pulls us out of the world, and the world's trying to draw us back. And it's really easy to drift into kind of old ruts or the world's ruts. And, you know, that, that kind of that zing, of the excitement of Jesus doing something different with us, can start to be held actually in tension. And rather than being exciting, it becomes a tension point. And that's, in essence, why the book of Hebrews was written, to address that kind of situation. And, so, and I think that's really common for us. So let's get into talking about the situation of Hebrews, like what's actually going on in the ancient world. Like we're looking over the shoulder of a conversation and if we can understand what we're looking over the shoulder of, it's going to help us understand what we're reading. And there's loads we don't know. So we're going to begin with a long list of all the things we don't know about the book of Hebrews. It's a little bit of an enigma. So who wrote it? Well, I can tell you who didn't write it. Okay? It wasn't Paul. Because the author describes their conversion experience, and it's different 
to Paul's conversion experience. And the style of the writing is really different to the way Paul would write. So it's not Paul, but the author does mention a connection to Timothy and the work that Timothy's team is doing, the ministry work that his team is doing. So it seems like it's someone that's connected with this crew of people that Paul raised up doing missionary work, establishing the church all across, all across Asia. So maybe a bit of a Paul connection. And we know from reading the book that it's someone that's really well educated and, and they really understand oratory and rhetoric. Um, the, the, we tend to use, uh, oh, yeah, you're a really good orator to just mean, oh, you speak really clearly. Okay, like Shelby. You listen to Shelby and the time goes by and you're just like absorbing what she's saying. It's amazing, right? But in the ancient world, there were prescribed ways that you expressed yourself in oratory. And this author is an expert at it. And so it's someone educated and it's someone who knows the Old Testament really well because they're just a, an absolute whiz at pulling things from the Old Testament, joining them up together to make his argument. And so it could be someone like Apollos. We don't know who it was, but in my mind, that's like it's a good type of a person that's writing. Apollos was someone that joined Paul's crew, knew the Old Testament really well, was a learn, learned kind of orator, um, and was continuing the work that Paul had started among the churches. Okay, so we don't know who wrote it, but we know the kind of person that wrote it. Who was it written to? Well, again, we don't know. So the, the, it's called... Uh, in, in most Bibles, uh, the, you know, Hebrews, and written to the Hebrews. And that name, Hebrews, goes back to a tradition in the third century where the church leaders, they looked at the amount of Old Testament references in this book and thought, well, surely it was written to Jews. But when we think about it for a second, the other books of the New Testament that use the Old Testament in a similar way, like Galatians and First Peter, we know they were written, actually, not to Jews, but to Gentile churches, to Gentile Christians. And so it's a little bit of a wrong assumption. And actually, it would make a lot of sense that the Old Testament would be used this way to write to Gentile Christians. Because remember, they didn't have a New Testament. The only Bible they had was the Old Testament scriptures. And they, the message of the gospel and the work of Jesus, had brought them into now being also heirs of Abraham children of the promise. And so they want to know, like, well, what promises? Who's Abraham? What's the story? Like, Jesus is the fulfillment of what? So they just really wanted to dive into the Old Testament and understand where this all comes from, because that's going to help anchor them in who God is and what God's story is about. And so this is almost written to help Gentile Christians understand how they can relate to and interact with God's big story. And so it's written to people just like us. That's good news. If you're not a Jew, it's all right. Like, you're not excluded from the book of Hebrews. Okay, when was it written? We don't know. Okay, yeah, there's a pattern forming, isn't there? Well, we do know it was written before AD 96, because Clement of Rome, one of the early church fathers, mentions it in a letter. And it's highly, highly likely it was written before AD 70, because the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, and given what the author is talking about, he really would have wanted to have mentioned that temple being destroyed. It really would have made sense for his argument. So probably somewhere in the 60s, and that's interesting, because that places it where the, this group, this church that has been formed, somewhere along Paul's uh, early stages of establishing new churches, Probably some time has passed, and now this book comes as like a second wave of interaction with this church. So they've been established, some stuff's happened, and then this book comes a little bit later as a response to what they've encountered and what's going on with them. So not quite sure when, but we've got somewhat of an idea. And where was it written? Can you guess the answer? We don't know. That's right. Yeah, it's going to be... It's a really easy Sunday. Just keep saying, I don't know. Um, well, it does seem there's some kind of connection to Rome because the author at the end mentions that the, those from Italy send their greetings. But we don't know whether that means it was written to Italy or from Italy or just wherever it was being written, there were some workers from Italy that were there doing ministry. 
So it really doesn't pin things down very much. So we don't really know uh, where it was written to or from. But here's something we do know, okay? We're turning the corner. It's all going to get better from here. We do know what kind of writing it is. It's very different to a lot of the letters of Paul. Letters had a standard formula of like how you would lay your ideas out. And Hebrews is really different. It actually has a lot more in common with a sermon or a speech. And so it reads really differently. Um, it's actually, it, it's probably a sermon that was given and then written down and then sent to this church. And so it, uh, the, the author actually refers to it as a brief word of exhortation, uh, which is great. You know, makes us glad that our sermons these days are a little bit simpler. I think we would struggle if we heard the book of Hebrews and something like that every week. We'd be like, oh, I'm completely overwhelmed. But in the ancient world, you know, they were hardcore. Their ability to, to listen, take it all in, process it all was next level. We got, we got ways to grow. And so it makes sense for us to, to frame it that way and refer to the author as, as the preacher or the pastor because that's actually the relationship they're taking to their readers. They're actually stepping in, back, maybe back in, to a situation the church finds itself in, and they want to care for it and shepherd it, and help them understand what's going on, and help them move towards Jesus. So here's the million-dollar question. The most important question when we're trying to figure out what's going on is why was this book written? And actually, the internal evidence in Hebrews gives us enough clues to build up a picture. So this was a community that had been formed because the gospel message had been brought to them. They'd heard about Jesus, and as they'd responded to Jesus, God's power had broken out by the Spirit, confirming the message and establishing them in this new relationship with Jesus. And they'd also been established in the foundational things of Jesus. They knew the basics. Okay, they, They'd been to like the 101 course. They, they knew... Uh, all the things that were necessary. They'd also experienced persecution. So they'd been established, God's power, they knew the basics, and they bumped into tension in their city. Being faithful to Jesus meant not doing what their city expected. And that led to problems. So some of them had been imprisoned. Some of them had then actually connected themselves with those in prison, which was a taboo thing to do. And they had lost property, they'd lost their wealth, they'd lost their status and influence in their city. And it's really important to understand the picture that lies behind this. So we just gotta put our history hats on. So the world of the first century was a deeply religious environment. Okay, there were, there were gods of everything and you honored the gods every step of the way. Okay, so you get up in the morning, you honor the god of the morning. You make your coffee, you honor the God of coffee. Like you go out of your house, you honor the God of opening a door. Like, like just every step along the way. And I, you think I'm being silly, but literally gods of everything. It was almost impossible to do any sort of social, familial, uh, civic, economical, like uh, across all of life, you were involved in honoring the gods. And, and it was a way to express honoring family, friends, the people you bought and sold from, the city you lived in, that you were for these things. So when these Christians said, no, no, we only honor Jesus, this was a deeply troubling thing for their neighbors, for the people in the city. Because to, re to refuse to honor all of these gods, to refuse to participate in the way the city did, this like, we're all for the thing we're doing together, meant that they were now a subversive element. They were actually traitors to their city. Because they couldn't be counted on to honor the gods of the city, they couldn't be counted on to be for the good of the city. This was antisocial behavior. And it was deeply troubling. And so what the city is doing by taking property and putting them in prison and, and basically leveraging shame is they're trying to steer them onto what they think is the right course. They're trying to save them from their folly and get them back on track where everyone else is. Did you catch that? So the city is exerting this pressure on them not to do things the Jesus way, 
because it, it's, it's kind of folly, but to do things the right way. And they'd resisted, okay? And that had led to imprisonment. It had led to shame. It had led to this tension. But some things have changed by the time the author is writing this book. So what's changed? Well, the long haul of living in tension with the city was beginning to take a toll. So we, we learn in chapter 12, they were growing weary and losing heart. They, they're just the oomph they had in their soul to keep resisting had been worn down. They were tired of this tension. We learn in uh, chapter two, they were drifting off course. So that, that distinctiveness was starting to wane. And the, the signposts they lived their life by had started to change. Faith in God's promises in chapter three was faltering. Their expectation, their hope, the things they were looking forward to and orienting themselves around, it had been what God had said, but that was faltering. They were stumbling and keeping that dynamic going in their life. In chapter 10, some of them were withdrawing from the community. So they were actually starting to change their relationships and their associations. And in chapter five, rather than continuing on from the basics to grow mature, they had actually, in chapter 10, been faltering in their commitment to Jesus. So rather than moving from the basics into maturity, the basics were not bearing that fruit, and they were actually beginning to just look like the people in their city. They needed Jesus at the center. They needed Jesus to be their center. Their life should be orbiting around Jesus. He should be the epicenter of their relationships, what they're for, how they do everything. But for them, Jesus had begun to move out to the margins. They had a Jesus association. They associated with Jesus. Like they could reach out. They had a connection with Jesus. But Jesus was not in the middle. And the author is writing to them saying, you need to persevere against the tension and keep Jesus at the center. So how do we connect to the readers? Okay, Because we don't need to worship some God every time we buy and sell in the marketplace, every time we make our coffee in the morning. right? But, do we live in tension with the city we live in? Is it hard to follow Jesus in Portland and in the USA? Yes. That should be a much louder yes. Okay? It's, it's different from some other places in the world. Okay? The, the form the tension takes can appear more subtle, but it is just as powerful. And living where we live, we are confronted with a different set of values and goals that shape our aspirations about what life is for and those values and characteristics that drive how we should live our lives. So how do we refuse to participate in our city? So we don't, we don't refuse to worship the little g-gods, but we are constantly invited to play the game that our city invites us to. Okay? to be consumers who will trample underfoot to get more wealth and security rather than refusing to put ourselves first. When we do it differently, that is confusing for people. It can be upsetting for people. Has anyone chosen not to put themselves first and had a, like a well-meaning parent or relative tell us we're doing our life wrong? Okay? We choose not to seek comfort and ease as the aim of the good life and instead choose sacrifice as the aim of the good life. We've got a different vision of what life is for. We refuse to bow down at the altars of politics and power and social influence. And we choose to bring our influence through loving compassion and service. We're going to do it differently. It, our, our city calls us to say the way you do good to others is to let them do whatever their heart's desire is and to leave them alone. And that we should seek acceptance by not ruffling any of these expectations so that everyone will leave us alone. 
That's the city's vision of social interaction. And Jesus says, no, you will be moved by loving compassion to engage the people around you with love and service and the gospel. Like, actually, when you think about it, we have huge tensions. We're not that dissimilar to these guys in the first century. And you're here in church. So you've begun with Jesus. And you find yourself wrestling to resist the city. Wrestling to persevere, to not drift, to not falter. Like, does anyone feel that? I feel that all the time. Not many hands went up, okay? Not many. You're either asleep or you're not being very honest, okay? It's hard. It's okay to say it's hard. And that's why I'm so excited for the book of Hebrews. I think there's some really important things that God has to say to us to strengthen us. So how do, how do we persevere? What has the pastor got to say to us? And so there's four key sections in the book of Hebrews, each one with a message that add up to a journey that leads us to persevering. And the first one is to listen to Jesus. And so we begin in this scene in Mount Sinai, where God is sending the angels to bring the Torah to Moses, God's law. And it's this profound moment of God revealing himself and doing something really pivotal to give his people a message that will move his plan forward. And the author's point, the pastor's point, is that God's doing it again. Something else profound and pivotal is happening. There's a God moment going on, but it's not Moses, and it's not the Torah, and it's not on Mount Sinai. God has now sent the ultimate messenger in Jesus with the ultimate message. And so it's not just God doing it again, but God has leveled up. And uh, we've really got to pay then ultimate attention to Jesus. And and it's a kind of, if this, then how much more this? You know, if we should have listened at Mount Sinai, how much more should we listen when God has sent his own son? And one of the big themes of Hebrews is this elevation of Jesus, to compare Jesus to all the other ways that God has helped his people, has shown up for his people, and revealed himself to his people that we would then appreciate and worship Jesus more. He wants us to just fall more deeply in love with who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Our appreciation would just go up and up and up. And in each point of comparison, whether it's the law, the, the Torah, or the priesthood, or the sacrificial system, or the covenants God made, like all these different things God did in the past... What he wants us to see is that each of these things is God reaching out and meeting some deep need we have. Something that really matters, that God wants to say, this matters, and I want to engage you around it. And it shows this continued pattern of God's faithfulness to meet us in those places and help us. But that Jesus is God's ultimate gift to help us and rescue us and meet us so that we can live in a way that matters, in a way that those things that are our deep needs can really thrive. And so this connects to the next section. If we should really pay attention to Jesus, we don't want to get it wrong by failing to respond. So the next big section is about failing to respond. We're invited to compare ourselves to that generation of people that were there at Mount Sinai. They didn't respond. They hardened their hearts, Their faith in God's promise faltered, and they turned back to Egypt. God had just rescued them from this place, this old place where they were slaves, and brought them across into this wilderness, ready to go into the promised land. They'd escaped, and because their faith faltered, they started to look back and think, well, maybe our hope is there and question where their hope was. And so they were the Exodus generation. And we connect with this. We have experienced an Exodus because of the cross. Jesus has created a break of freedom from the old and from the world because of the cross. But then they became the wilderness generation. Their journey had become something epic had happened, but they were not yet 
in the promised land, experiencing the fulfillment of everything God had promised. Their journey had begun, but it wasn't complete yet. They were in the now and not yet of their salvation. They were not yet established. And again, we can associate. We are like a wilderness generation. We are in a now and not yet. Jesus has inaugurated God's kingdom. He's begun it. He's established it. But God's kingdom work is not yet complete, and it won't be until he returns. God's work in us, he's freed us from the world, but we still live in it. And the work of getting the world out of us is still going on, teaching us how to be more like Jesus. Our becoming is not yet complete. And this wilderness generation, in their now and not yet, they failed to respond to the message they received. And here's the pastor's point. Here's his warning to us. If we fail to respond when a greater message is at stake, how much worse would that be? And so the stakes are raised for us. And this is the first warning. There's actually five warning passages throughout the book of Hebrews, and they're all versions of the same thing. They're different flavors of this same warning. Don't fail to respond to Jesus. Don't stop responding to Jesus. And then unpacking how not responding would affect us and our salvation and our relationship with God. And I've mentioned salvation a couple of times. This is a key concept for us to get right if we're going to read the book of Hebrews and not get confused. So when we use the word salvation, we often use it in Western modern Christianity to talk about our destiny when we die. Like, are you saved? Yes. When I die, like I've got an insurance card that means Jesus is going to take me to heaven. And so it becomes about that. And the Bible does sometimes use it that way, to talk about our destiny. But it's also used to refer to the process of God rescuing us from Egypt and taking us on a journey to establish us in the promised land. If we're being saved, we're transitioning from the old reality, getting out of it and becoming the new reality so that God's promises are actually fully experienced and fully established, fully realized. And that idea of growing out of the old into the new, being fully formed by Jesus, being rescued from worldliness into freedom, realizing all that God has laid before us, that's the version of salvation that the book of Hebrews is talking about. And it's, it's this idea of a process God is doing, that he is continually rescuing us. And it's like our destiny is rescued, but our experience is being rescued. Catch the difference? And so it's really important we get that right. Hebrews, talking about the second one. Otherwise, there's some bits of Hebrews we're going to read. going to get really confusing for us. Okay, so that's the first two sections. The third section. And this is the longest section in the book. And it's all about how God has honored us and been faithful to us and given gifts to us. It's all about motivating us to respond by understanding more deeply everything Jesus has done for us. So this is going to be, I'm looking forward to this, it's going to be a really awesome part of the book of Hebrews. And what we basically do is we tore the tabernacle. The tabernacle was that place where all of the institutions that God established to help his people, to rescue and save his people, were located. And the author is going to take us around and show us that the priesthood, the covenant, the systems of sacrifice, the things that restored our relationship with God, that meant that we could trust God, that meant that we were safe with God and secure with God. All of these things are a part of God's heart, and Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's heart, the ultimate gift, the ultimate expression of God doing these things. Jesus is the ultimate gift to bring God's help and salvation. And so this brings us to another key concept for us to get right, or a set of concepts. And it's all to do with grace, this idea of a gift. So in the ancient world, if someone was a benefactor, okay, so today we sort of use the word philanthropist, but it's a slightly different concept in the ancient world. If someone had status and wealth and 
a position in the city, one of the, what that was for, or like all of those finances and influence and connections and relationships, everything they had at their disposal, it's, you know, maybe you could think of like the mob boss in New York, okay? They can call in a lot of favors. Um, probably the wrong picture, because picturing Jesus as the ultimate mob boss is a <laughs> bit weird. But it's okay, it's a broken metaphor. Um, but what that person had all those things at their fingertips for was not so they could just make their life more comfortable. They had those things so they could use them to help others so that they themselves could become more honorable people. In the ancient world, it was a thirst. Life was a thirst and a drive not to just acquire more stuff, but to actually acquire honor. And so when you did good, when you were a benefactor, when you used your gifts to help someone, when you showed grace, okay, you were actually helping save and rescue someone from something. But that gift you gave, it didn't then turn into a financial debt that this person now owed you. Okay, that's the mob boss way, maybe. It's like, now you owe me 10% of your earnings or something. No, it didn't initiate a debt of commodity, but it initiated a relationship of grace. And so how that benefactor had acted meant that you could now continue to expect grace from them. They'd initiated this relationship where they had taken you under their wing and said, I'm going to protect this person. And they could now expect honor from you. Okay? When they showed grace to you, they honored you, bringing you into their circle, and now you owed them your honor. And so you would show them your allegiance. You would give them your service. You would give them your gratitude. You would use your life to now build their status and their reputation. And failing to do these things would dishonor the relationship and it would bring shame upon yourself. So grace sits at the heart of the dynamics of shame and honor in a culture. And this is going to help us understand this huge pattern of reasoning that's going on in the book of Hebrews, this big picture argument. The city, remember, was shaming them. It was shaming these young Christians. And the risk is that they would disobey Jesus and mute their witness to try and regain honor in their city. Conversely, okay, they also stand at the crossroads of whether they will honor God. If they fail to persevere, they will bring shame from God because they will be dishonoring God. But if they persevere, God will honor them and they will receive more grace from God. So either way, whichever choice they make, they are going to have some shame to deal with. And what the author is trying to get them to think about is, will it be from God or from the city? Will their honor and status and blessing be grounded in God or in the city? And the pastor wants them to see that the benefits of faithfulness to God far, far outweigh the benefits of honoring the city. And the flip side of it, the shame of dishonoring God is far, far worse than the shame you experience from dishonoring the city. Basically, what God promises and what God gives far outweighs the cost of living in tension with the city. Jesus is worth it. But the twist, to see this, they need to have this eternal perspective because they're in the now and not yet. So a lot of what they will actually receive, that, like, that honor and the gifts and the fullness of it is future. It's in the resurrection. And so the author wants them to change their perspective. By getting their perspective caught too much in the here and now, the price, the current experience of a cost was weighing on their mind more than the prize that lay before them. And so the author is going to try to shift our perspective to help us have a better grasp of which things should weigh on us as we do this kind of cost-benefit analysis. And so if we get all this right, and we're like, yeah, I get it. Like, I, I want God's honor. I want to persevere. I want to deal with the, the shame of the city. This brings us to the last section of then, so, so what do I do? How do I respond? 
And this last section is all about how we honor God in the city. What does it look like to actually go on and persevere, to shun sin and live holy lives, to choose to be faithful and grateful to Jesus, to appreciate him and worship him as he's elevated, to go deeper in community with the people of faith, and to go deeper in maturity in our becoming, both of which strengthen us to actually be able to persevere and to then live confident lives. And this word confidence is a really interesting term. Okay? Everything we think about, like the American version of confidence, just get that out of your mind for a second, because this Greek term confident is basically the opposite of what it means to be ashamed. So we don't need to live ashamed lives. We can actually live with a boldness and an openness that is the opposite of being ashamed. What the pastor is telling us is that we can live a life in the city that is shaped by God's honor, not the city's shame. And that's the ultimate invitation of like where we should exit the book of Hebrews. That yes, there's tension with the city, but we can live a life in this city with a profound witness because of the way God honors us despite the city shame. And, and this last section really brings faith into the foreground. And this is the last big concept for us to get right. There's all sorts of ways we use the, this term faith in the 21st century. Uh, having faith in Jesus can mean um, I've come to realize that Jesus is worth following. I'm kind of pro-Jesus. Um, it can mean we've entrusted our final destiny to Jesus. Like we've bought the insurance card. Like I want to go to heaven, so I want to put my faith in Jesus. Or it can mean uh, we know that we can turn to Jesus when we're in trouble and he will help us. Like all sorts of things. But Hebrews is talking about faith in the context of salvation. And remember, not salvation meaning one day we'll get to heaven, but salvation meaning the continued journey, the continued experience of God saving us from the old into the new, rescuing us from the world and establishing us as us as his people in the midst of the city. And that salvation is gained by both coming to faith and living faithfully. What we need to experience salvation is to have faith in Jesus and live faithfully to Jesus in response to our faith, our hope, our trust being put in Jesus. And so this idea of in trusting and having faith in Jesus, and then living faithfully in response. They're two halves of one whole. And and actually, for most of the Bible, they're two halves of one whole. Uh, We just sometimes don't think about it, but especially in the book of Hebrews, we need to remember when we're reading about having faith, that it includes how how we live because we are people of faith. And when it calls us and talks to us about being faithful, It's talking about living a life that is shaped by who we trust, who our faith is in. And if we don't get these two halves together, again, Hebrews, it's going to be a really confusing read for us. And so that, that's the four sections. That is the book of Hebrews in a nutshell. I'm really excited because I think it's almost, you know, some of the, the terms may have changed. But if this pastor was to look at our situation as God's people, like what kind of message would he write? I think it would be really similar for us today, trying to fight the tension of our city and live faithfully to Jesus. I'm really excited about how we're going to have Jesus elevated and understand how to honor him more. And so I just want to finish with a couple of hot tips, practical tips. Okay, how do you do this series? We're going to be in the book of Hebrews for a while, guys. It's going to be really exciting, okay? Um, And there's a lot in there. There's an awful lot in this book, okay? So each Sunday, we're going to be in a section of Hebrews, and we're going to be pulling out a couple of the big ideas that we think Jesus really wants to talk to all of us about. But not every detail. So what if one of those details actually might be really important for you? Or what if God has something to show you on Sunday, but it connects to a bunch of other stuff, and God actually has a one-on-one conversation he wants to continue with you? Spoiler alert, I'm almost sure he does. Okay? 
Well, that's why we're inviting you to read the book with us, to read along with us. And so Sunday will get you oriented, and then we want you to keep listening, keep seeking Jesus by reading that section of Hebrews one or two times that week. And so we've got a resources page on the website, and it's got a guide for how to read with Jesus, to prayerfully bring Jesus with Bible open and ask Jesus what he's got to show you. We've got an outline of the book of Hebrews so that whichever section we're in, you kind of can see, okay, where does this lie in the flow of Hebrews? What are some of the big ideas we've been looking out for? Um, And some resources. If you want to go a bit deeper, if you want to understand a bit more and really get your head around what's going on in the book of Hebrews. It's got a book to recommend. This book, Hebrews, Grace and Gratitude by De Silva, it is an excellent book to read. It's really clear. It's really practical. It takes some of the big ideas in Hebrews and just crystallizes them in a paragraph way better than I could. And so there's some of these out in the cafe or just hop on Amazon. This is a recommended read. It would just be reading a couple of pages a week, so it's not a big read. And then the last practical tip is don't do it alone. This whole like trying to listen to Jesus and discern what Jesus is saying and responding to Jesus is so much harder when we do it alone. So be reading Hebrews with your community, talking with your community about what God's showing you and what what he's doing in your life. And if you're not in community, come to Beta on Wednesdays. We're going to be talking about Hebrews there. And so don't do it alone. Even if it means just like grabbing someone for coffee once a week, don't do it alone. And so let's stand. And what we're going to do is pray and just invite Jesus to prepare our hearts for the things he's got to show us. And so if you want to just close your eyes and uh, if you find it helpful to use your posture to just tell your heart the right posture to take, just hold out your hands. Thanks for listening. For more resources and to partner with us through giving, visit us at ajesuschurch.org.